Okay, so let us continue with uh, our discussion on algebraic geometry. So, you know, uh, so let me recall uh, what we have uh, seen until last until the last time. So, broadly, algebraic geometry is a study of uh, the geometry of the set of common zeros of a bunch of polynomials. So, what we do is we take k to be an algebraically closed field. And of course, uh, uh, what is the significance of, of this is, well, um, uh, the significance is that you have uh, uh, the null stall and such, which tells you that uh, uh, zeros of uh, common zeros of a bunch of polynomials, uh, uh, is this the set of common zeros of a bunch of polynomials is not going to be an empty set, provided the the set of uh, th those bunch of that bunch of polynomials doesn't generate uh, the whole ring okay so that's the reason why you choose an algebraically closed field and what we have is basically we have this uh, uh, you know there is a dictionary uh, or we rather try to set up a dictionary on one side which is the geometric side on the other side uh, being the commutative algebra side so what we have in the on the geometric side uh, side is uh, the the affine space over k which is actually uh, kn namely k cross k cross k n copies this is the cartesian product of k taken with itself in n times of course n is greater than or equal to 1 and it is k n not just k n but it is with with the the so called Zariski topology. So well if you just look at k n uh, you would normally think of it as n dimensional vector space over k okay but the point is uh, and, and and in a vector space 0 is a very special vector okay but we want we do not want to think of it as a vector space we want to think of it as affine space so 0 does not have the point 0 does not have any special uh, meaning uh, in the case of vectors it does have a special meaning because uh, a vector uh, always needs an initial point and a terminal point and we always take the initial point to be th the origin okay but here in affine space any two points are literally the same except that only the coordinates have changed okay so but more importantly what is imp uh, the what we have is not just a set it's not just the cartesian product uh, this cartesian product base is it consists of n tuples of elements of k okay it's not just the cartesian product as a set but there is a so called what is that zariski topology it comes from the it rather comes from the competitive algebra side so let me put that on this side this is the commutative algebra side on this side we have the polynomial ring in n variables over k so x1 through xn 
or n uh, indeterminates or n variables and uh, uh, of course this is the polynomial taken in n variables okay. So these are polynomials in these n variables with coefficients coming from the field k okay and how do you get the Zariski topology you get the Zariski topology uh, by prescribing of course any topology is given by either prescribing uh, a collection of closed sets or a collection of open sets and these two are complementary to each other because a closed set is a complement of an open set and vice versa. So the approach to the Zariski topology is by specifying a collection of closed sets and how do you specify this collection of closed sets what you do is well you take any subset of, uh, of this polynomial ring which means you are just taking a bunch of polynomials in n variables with k coefficients and what you do is associate to that subset the set of zeros of uh, the set of common zeros of that subset. So this set this subset here will be all those n tuples uh, which satisfy each and every polynomial in this collection in this subset okay and we we declare sets like this to be the closed sets. So they are given a name they are called algebraic sets because they are the they are the common zero locus of a bunch of algebraic equations okay the solutions to a bunch of algebraic equations you can think of uh, the the equation corresponding to each polynomial as a polynomial being equated to 0 and then the solutions are nothing but the zeros of the polynomial okay. So the algebraic sets are sets like this and they are uh, if you declare them as closed sets then you see that they satisfy the axioms for closed sets and therefore uh, this uh, sets of uh, subsets of this kind uh, uh, taken as closed sets does define a topology on on these uh, on the set kn and along with this topology uh, we call kn as the affine space n dimensional affine space over k we give this special symbol uh, and uh, we call this topology is Zariski topology okay in honor of uh, Oscar Zariski who is you whom you could say is a founding uh, father of algebraic geometry uh, from the from the viewpoint of competitive algebra okay. So and then I told you that uh, uh, the uh, so uh, yeah so there there's, there was a there was a uh, uh, so on this side we have uh, uh, a collection of nice sets namely the algebraic sets which are the closed sets but on this side you seem to only have subsets of the uh, of the of the polynomial ring but then uh, a subset uh, doesn't make sense as a sub object of the polynomial ring and the right sub objects are ideals okay and of course these everything here is commutative the case of course a always a commutative field we are in this course we are only worried about commutative rings. So uh, and therefore you know ideals are always two sided okay. So the point is you if you want the right objects on this side uh, more interesting than the subsets are the ideals and how do you pass from subset to an ideal uh, this is a very general uh, yoga it is a general philosophy that you can always take the smallest uh, sub object which contains your subset in any mathematical structure if you have a subset which is not a sub object then how do you get a sub object you just look at a small the smallest sub object which contains that subset it is called the sub object generated by the subset okay. So in this case you can take the ideal the sub objects which you are interested in are ideals of course you know you can think of sub rings also as sub objects okay but sub rings are not going to help because the point is the moment uh, this set contains a unit then uh, uh, the 0 set will become empty okay because the uh, 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 a unit has to be just a constant polynomial which is non zero okay and that constant polynomial is never going to vanish anywhere so the the 0 set will become empty. So certainly you are not interested in uh, sets like this which uh, which contain one or which can generate one so basically you are only interested in so so that tells you that you are not interested in sub rings and what other objects uh, sub objects can you think of you can think of uh, ideals and why ideals because ideals are really uh, nice sub objects because the nice sub objects are the ones uh, which can give you quotient objects okay. So you know if you have ring and you have an ideal uh, then you can 
get the quotient ring okay whereas of course if you have a ring and a sub ring uh, I am not going to get any quotient okay. So from the point of view of uh, a sub object being the right one if it gives a decent quotient object you see that uh, ideals are preferred okay ideals are the right choice and sub rings are not but anyway we do not want sub rings because uh, this is going to end up as a as the null set if you are going to take uh, a sub ring okay. So, so the upshot of all this is that you look at uh, the the ideal generated uh, by this uh, by this subset which I put as bracket s and then you see that uh, the if you take the 0 set of the ideal generated by s okay that turns out to be the same as the 0 set uh, generated by s uh, I mean the, 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 the 0 set of s the 0 set of the ideal generated by s is the same as the 0 set of s. So what it tells you is that if you replace a set by the ideal it generates you are not going to change anything here okay. So we so the advantage of all this is on this side on this side you have closed subsets on this side you have you have ideals okay and not just subsets and what is a prescription though we started out with subsets we uh, always take the ideal generated by the subset and work with that okay and uh, that does not change anything on this side okay because of this equality. Now uh, so as I told you the the um, you know uh, the whole purpose of algebraic geometry is to look at this uh, these two sides of the picture okay and go from one side to the other and keep translating what properties on one side mean on the other side. So geometric properties on this side should mean uh, they should give rise to some ring theoretic properties which means they will give rise to some ideal theoretic properties more, more generally they might give rise to module theoretic properties on this side and conversely some uh, module theoretic or ideal theoretic properties or ring theoretic properties on this side will correspond to geometric properties on this side and and our and the aim of algebraic geometry is to is to discover this relationship okay. Um, so, uh, so the first thing I wanted to say is uh, uh, you know uh, well but there, there are two points I have to mention. So, the first point is uh, so let me again recall uh, you know an algebraically closed field is a field in which if you take a polynomial of one variable in o, uh, in one variable over that field and if it is non constant then all its zeros are there in that field okay. So, normally field theory tells you that if you have a polynomial over a field then you may have to go to an extension field to find the zeros of the polynomial okay and in fact a field theory uh, gives you what is called as a, a splitting field for a given polynomial which is a kind of uh, a smallest field extension over which the polynomial completely splits into linear factors. But you know you do not have to worry about such things uh, I mean if you are working with an algebraic closed field because the definition of algebraic closed field tells you that if you have a polynomial it will already split into linear factors that means all the which is equivalent to saying that all the zeros of the polynomial are already elements of this field okay. But the story does not end there this the the, the, the the important thing is the when you define algebraically closed field it is only for one variable okay. But when we do algebraic geometry in this general sense we are worried about polynomials not in just one variable we are worried about polynomials in several variables. And then the question that arises is if you give me a you know a subset of polynomials or for that matter the ideal that it generates and look at the 0 set what is the condition that uh, the 0 set is non empty okay. And uh, the Hilbert null stellen sorts uh, tells you that uh, uh, this will be non empty so long as this ideal is really a proper ideal so long as this ideal is not the whole ring or the unit ideal okay. So in other words this should not contain a unit we, we all know that if it contains a unit if S contains a unit it is very clear that this is empty okay and the Hilbert null stellen sorts say, tells you that that is the only case when it is empty. So long as this does not contain a unit and of course it is very important that uh, you know uh, uh, well I should correct my statement a little uh, this may not contain a unit but this might generate a unit okay. So to be very strict this ideal should not be uh, this ideal should not contain a unit which is the same as saying this ideal should not be the whole ring okay. 
in that case and then and only then will the zero set uh, uh, be non empty okay and that assurance is given to you by the hilbert null sensors okay that's one important thing then the other thing is uh, the other important theorem that comes uh, 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 is the the hilbert's basis theorem or emi no noether theorem okay so uh, you see you already see the impact of uh, uh, results on this side which means something on this side you see the the fact that uh, the hilbert's null sensors sats is uh, basically a result which comes from this side of the diagram okay if you want to if you want to think of commutative algebra also as involving field theory for that matter because you know fields come uh, because uh, you know you start with a ring uh, basically you start with uh, rings which are integral domains and then if you go to the quotient field or the field of fractions then you know studying things over that already leads you into uh, field theory okay and so you know null sensors sats is a kind of result that you know uh, comes in on this side of the picture but geometrically it means that uh you know the zero set you are working with uh, gives you conditions when the zero set you are working with is not empty okay that's a, that's already a uh, that's also a, that's already a translation from a result on this side to this side okay and uh, but the way i've given it i've already given it on this side okay i i haven't i haven't told you the commutative algebraic version of the null sensors sats which i will do okay and the, the the other statement that i am worried about is uh, uh, that i want to uh, talk about is about the uh, uh, the hilbert basis theorem or the emi noether theorem uh, what uh, what does it say it says well it says that if you start with a ring r a commutative ring uh, of course you know you must always remember that we always work only with commutative rings with one and we always assume that all ring homomorphisms take one to one okay so if you start with a noetherian commutative ring okay uh, which means a ring is uh, which means that the ring satisfies a property that every ideal is finitely generated then if you take a polynomial ring in finitely many variables over that ring the polynomial ring also becomes noetherian okay so if you take for the ring a field you know a field is always noetherian because it has only two ideals namely the zero ideal and the full field which is the unit ideal so it's noetherian and uh, now if you apply, apply hilbert's uh, basis theorem or emi noether's theorem you get that this ring is noetherian what it means is therefore that every ideal is finitely generated okay now what is the importance of saying that an ideal is finitely generated the importance is that every element uh, in this ideal can be written as a finite linear combination of a fixed number of elements with ring coefficients that's what it means but what it really means is that you can take for this generating set only a finite set of polynomials and what it means therefore is even though you start with a set which is probably infinite okay or you start with an ideal which is infinite okay uh, in fact um, an ideal will be infinite because uh, even if it has one elements uh, one element then it will contain all multiples of that element by the ring elements and this is going to this is an there are infinitely many elements here because k is a, any algebraically closed field is infinite that's a result from field theory okay and uh, this polynomial ring is also infinite so all these ideals are all going to have infinitely many elements and your when you look at the common zeros of uh, elements in the ideal you seem to be looking for common zeros for infinitely many polynomials but then what the uh, hilbert's basis theorem tells you is that that's not what is happening really what is really happening is you are just looking at the zero set of finitely many polynomials so what it tells you is that even if s is infinite in any case uh, any ideal like this will always be infinite that ideal is the same as the ideal generated by finitely many polynomials okay and therefore the zero set is just the common zeros of these finitely many polynomials and uh, in fact this is a set uh, this is the same as the intersection of the zero sets of the individual polynomials okay z of fi is just the uh, zero the zeros of fi okay and then if you if you take the intersection you will get 
to points which are zeros of all the fi's which is exactly what this means this, this, this is the set of common zeros of all the fi's and of course uh, this tells you that uh, you are always only going to solve finitely many equations okay and why this is uh, why this is important is it is also important for computation okay because once you have finitely many things to deal with you can have inductive procedures you based on some ordering for example you can do lot of computations uh, in commutative algebra uh, using software and uh, all this is possible just because of this this result that you are only dealing with finitely many polynomials at a time okay so that is the importance of uh, these two very basic <laughs> but very important theorems one is the hilbert uh, null schlenzarts and the other is the uh, the hilbert basis theorem okay fine so that's the that's the setup now so what i want to do is i want to give you uh, 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 something that goes in both directions okay so already i have i have this z which associates to every subset or every ideal on this side the common zero locus on this side okay i also want to give something on this in this direction okay i want to give something in this direction so uh, so when i go from this direction uh, so from how do i go from here to there so you know if so let t uh, be a subset of an okay and mind you this is just a subset is just some collection of points okay i am not requiring that it is closed or open or something like that i am just taking any subset and what i do is from here i associate it uh, associate to t i of t which is called the ideal of t okay this is the ideal of t okay and what is the ideal of t this is a set of all polynomials in the in the polynomial ring such that f of uh, uh, f of uh, okay so let me write it like this f of t equal to 0 for every t in small t in capital t okay this is called the ideal of a subset okay. So there are, there are two statements I want I want you to understand first thing is I am defining a set and I am calling it an ideal okay in general that is not correct. I can define a set then I have to verify it is an ideal okay. So, the fact is that but if you, you, that if you really look at this definition it is obvious that it is an ideal because you see if you take two such f's say f 1 and f 2 then if f 1 and f 2 both vanish at every point of t then so does the sum okay and of course 0 vanishes at every point of t. So, 0 is there so this closed under addition this has 0 and of course for that matter if van if f vanishes at every point of t so does minus f okay and also if f vanishes at uh, every point of capital t then multiplying f by a g will also vanish at every point of capital t so this is an ideal so it is in fact an ideal and this is called the ideal corresponding to the subset okay and so you see now we have uh, uh, so basically what is happening is that to us subset here we are we associate a, uh, a set here which is actually closed okay it is an algebraic set and in fact for an ideal here also we can associate a subset here which is actually closed okay and in this direction given a subset you associate an ideal okay. So, you can see more or less that uh, on this side you are worried about closed sets okay and on this side you are worried about ideals okay. So, let us explore uh, the properties of these two uh, these two um, associations many of them are quite uh, you know uh, quite straightforward. So, the first thing is uh, uh, so let us look at uh, the uh, association in this direction okay that associates to every subset uh, the 0 set of that subset. So, the the 
the fact I want to put is that this association uh, is actually inclusion reversing okay on this see on both sides you have subsets only thing is here the special subsets that we are interested in are closed subsets and here the subsets that we are interested in are ideals okay but nevertheless inclusion makes sense on both sides as a as a partial order okay and what i want to say is that both of these associations they they just invert the they are, they are not order previous, uh, preserving but they are order reversing okay so what it means is that you know if s1 uh, so let me write that down as a lemma it's pretty easy to see if s1 is subset of s2 then well z of s1 uh, contains z of s2 uh, the second thing is uh, the second thing is uh, the corresponding result on this side if t1 is contained in t2 then ideal of t2 contains ideal of t1 okay so it's uh, if you look at it it's pretty easy to understand you see if you start with s1 inside s2 uh, probably i uh, i'm making a mistake somewhere okay i'm probably i'm making some obvious mistake so uh, let me let me let me talk through this okay so you see s1 uh, s2 has more equations than s1 okay so uh, a solution uh, a point of the affine space which satisfies every equation in s2 will always uh, satisfy every equation in s1 so this is correct right i think there isn't anything wrong there and look at this if t1 uh, contains t2 okay then if you take a function which vanishes at every point of t2 then it will vanish at every point of t1 therefore probably this has to be the other way around okay so probably that was a mistake you were uh, pointing out yeah so if t1 is contained in t2 then the ideal of t2 is contained in ide ideal of t1 because the way i first wrote it it is it seems to be order preserving which is not correct okay fine so so this is quite obvious but what is not uh, not directly obvious is the following thing you see what happens if you go and come back okay so if i start with the t on this side okay then i take the ideal of that and then i take the zero of that what do i get so this is a this is something that one has to worry about and then the other one is the other way around if i start with uh, well i said a subset here i take the zero set of that then i take the ideal of that what do i get okay so this is what we want to uh, we want to investigate and the answer to that is well the answer to this is that you get the closure of t okay mind you i started the set t the set t need not be closed but when i take i of t it becomes an ideal and when i take z of i of t it's a closed set because z of anything is closed by definition therefore what i am going to get is a closed set which contains t t is of course going to be here but it's very clear any any point of capital t will be a common zero of all the functions which vanish on all of t and therefore it's going to be here so it's clear that this contains t and it's a closed set containing t but the fact is that it is the smallest closed set which contains c t and therefore it is t closure okay and then as for as this is concerned this is uh, literally the uh, 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 involves the uh, the commutative algebra version of the null cell ensembles so what it says is this is just uh, this is just the radical of the ideal generated by s okay and so the uh, so as for the proof i think 1 and 2 are obvious okay 
they are quite uh, straightforward. Okay. The question is uh, with uh, 3 and 4 all right. So, if you look at 3, so let us prove 3 uh, clearly T is contained in Z of i of T right that is very clear because uh, every point of T is a common 0 of all those functions which vanish at every point of T that is what it says i of T is all those functions which vanish at every point of capital T and z of i of t is all those points at which all these functions vanish okay. and therefore, t contained in z of i of t is obvious, but more importantly if t is contained in f and f is closed then what will happen is that you will see that uh, it will follow that z of i of t is contained in f okay. What this means is that z of i of t because z of i is i of t is already closed it means that z of i of t is the smallest closed set which contains t it is a closed set which contains t and uh, z of i of t is a closed set which contains t and whenever some other closed set contains t that closed set also contains z of i of t. So, this this implies that z of i of t is equal to t bar because by definition uh, the closure of a subset is the smallest closed set which contains that subset and which you can obtain set, set theoretically as the intersection of all the closed sets which contain that subset okay. So, so I think it is it is um, so I have written it will follow that it is something that you can very easily check okay and the as for the uh, proof of 4 well um, so one way is kind of uh, obvious and it is the other way which is not obvious and which involves inverse transverse okay. So, you can see that i of z of s is the same as i of z of ideal generated by s because uh, z of s and z of ideal generated by s are the same okay and I think uh, it is very it should be very clear that uh, uh, this contains uh, radical of s this should be very clear because you see you what is an element of the radical of s uh, radical of the ideal generated by s it means it is an element whose power is in the ideal generated by s okay and that but any element in the ideal generated by s will be in this ideal okay and therefore it will be essentially an element that will vanish uh, at every point of uh, z of s okay and therefore the element whose you started with will also vanish at uh, the points of z of s so this will be obvious what is what is uh, uh, what is more uh, difficult is the other way around namely if you start with a function which vanishes at every point of z of s then some power of the function is actually in the ideal generated by s that is the non trivial part and that is precisely the uh, commutative algebra version of the Hilbert Nelson ansatz okay so so let me write that uh, this is this is obvious since f belongs to root of i mean ideal of uh, radical of the ideal generated by s means f power r belongs to f power m belongs to 
for ideal ideal generated by S. And this implies which which implies that um, F for M uh, belongs to to I of Z of S. And so, in fact, I should say uh, more importantly, not only this, what it means is that F for M belongs to okay, so uh, F for M vanishes on, on Z of S, okay, which means f vanishes on z of s okay so 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 this this means that uh, i mean this means that if you start with an f in the radical of the ideal generated by s it has to be in the ideal of z of s okay so this is kind of uh, this is kind of obvious. What is not obvious is the following. <coughs> Conversely, uh, if f is an i of z of s, that is, f vanishes on z of s, then f power m belongs to s for so let me add for some m greater than 0 due to the commutative algebraic version of the hilbert okay so uh, they so so what is the commutative algebraic version let me let me expand on that so here is hilberts millstone sets Uh, so this is the this is what is called the strong form strong form commutative algebraic uh, if k is an algebraically closed field and I in K x one etcetera x n is a proper ideal. Okay, then the ideal of Z of I is uh, contained in rad I. This is the uh, this is the commutative algebraic version. In fact, we often say it as i of z of i equal to rad i, okay. But the fact that i of z of i contains rad i is something that is uh, obvious, okay. But what is not obvious is that i of z of i is contained in rad i, namely, if there is a function which vanishes on z of i, then some power of the function is in i. Because radical of an ideal is just all those elements, some power of which, some positive integral power of which is in the ideal, and you can check that that is a bigger ideal, in fact. Okay, and what this says is that if a function vanishes on the zero locus of an ideal, then some power of the function has to be in the ideal, which means that function has to be in the. It may not be in the ideal, but some power is in the ideal. Therefore, the function is in the radical of the ideal. So, if you think of the radical as uh, trying to expand the ideal by trying to take all possible nth roots of elements in the ideal, okay. So, this is the Hilbert's null sun sets, this is the commutative algebraic form, okay. Oh, yeah. So, uh, as as one of the 
students rightly points out uh, maybe uh, okay so let me make the correction right from here let me call this let me use a script i okay for the for going from this direction to this direction so I will change this to script i okay so that uh, things become far better so this changes to script i this changes to script i and this changes to script i so does this yeah so it is it it is a lot more helpful to have this kind of notation which does not confuse so I will change it everywhere. Yeah, of course, the statement here that f power m is in the ideal generated by s uh, for some m greater than 0 is another way of saying that f is in the radical of the ideal generated by s, which is what we want for the other for the other uh, inclusion. Okay. And here let me let me put script i here so that it it becomes better to read. Okay. And you know uh, you see I ha I gave a so called weak form of the Hilbert notes on sets okay what was the weak form the weak form was uh, the assurance that so long as an ideal is not the unit ideal the zero set defined by the ideal is going to be non empty okay and that weak form can be deduced from this strong form as follows if an ideal is not the unit ideal then that translates to the fact that the radical of the ideal is not also a unit ideal an ideal is a you can check that the ideal is a is a unit ideal an ideal is a unit ideal namely the whole ring if and only if the radical of the ideal is also a unit ideal the reason is because if uh, because of the fact that if a power of an element is a unit then that element itself has to be a unit okay so i not being the unit ideal uh, i being the uh, uh, i being the unit ideal is the same as the radical of i being the unit ideal okay and then of course you see uh, if z of i uh, is empty okay if z of i is empty then the ideal of the empty set is a whole ring okay so if you assume that uh, i is not a unit not a unit ideal then you will get a contradiction from this if z of i is empty so you should read it in fact uh, you should read it with equality okay because the other inclusion is obvious so this strong form of the uh, uh, hilbert null sets and such does ensure that you know so long as i is not the unit ideal the the zero set is non empty okay so that's how the strong form gives the so called weak form okay so what one needs to know is you know since you have two associations going in two directions you would like to make this uh, into you would like to see this as a bijective you know equivalence and it is obvious that you will have to restrict the subsets here and the subsets there and what we are going to do next is uh, is, is to, to, to go towards that okay. So the uh, uh, see the problem is on both sides the arrows are not injected the associations are not injected for example you know if I take uh, an ideal i and if I take the radical of the ideal i they both go to the same thing here okay so if I if I take i here uh, if I take i here which is contained in its radical every ideal is of course contained in its radical okay then both of these things they go to the same thing the zero sets are the same the zero sets are the same okay so you have two different things going to the same thing here okay so to avoid this what you will expect is that on this side you should replace 
uh, ideals by radical ideals okay not just look at all ideals first of all not look at all subsets you pass from subsets to ideals and then do not just look at ideals look at radical ideals okay. Then you see that you can expect that this kind of a thing does not happen okay. So on this side you put radical ideals alright and on this side you put closed sets then the then it is a fact that this is a it is a bijective correspondence. So uh, radical ideals on this side and closed subsets on this side is the first letter of the uh, bijective correspondence okay and uh, the other important thing is you know uh, this this statement about uh, inclusions being reversed what it tells you is that uh, as the ideals become bigger the zero sets become smaller okay. So in fact when I say ideals become bigger it is with respect to inclusion and you know the biggest ideals with respect to the inclusion non trivial ideals with respect to the inclusion are the maximal ideals. So what you can imagine is that the biggest ones on this side are the maximal ideals and they will correspond to the smallest sets on this side and what do you expect them to be they will be points okay. So what will happen is that the the biggest ideals here the maximal ideals they correspond to the smallest sets here which are the points and it is again uh, a corollary of the Hilbert null and sets and all all this machinery that we have built up that the set of points in the fine space can be simply identified with the set of maximal ideals in the uh, in this competitive ring okay and uh, the beautiful thing is so therefore you know uh, you are able to see the set of points here which is geometric as again uh, a set of points there but these are not actually points here you have to form another space called the maximal spectrum the maximal spectrum of ring is a set which contains all the maximal ideals of the ring and uh, the fact is if you take the maximal spectrum of this polynomial ring what you get back is a fine space okay but this is getting it back as a set the truth is it does not stop there the truth is that on this maximal spectrum here there is a Zariski topology and if you take that Zariski topology and and give that topological structure to the maximal spectrum then that topological space becomes homeomorphic to this. So it is not just a bijective correspondence but it is a topological homeomorphism. So you see the in conclusion what is happening is that you have finally managed to completely rub off the geometric side and obtain it completely using competitive algebra. So you see your affine space along with the Zariski topology can be completely forgotten and you can recover it only from the competitive algebra side by doing what by taking the so called maximal spectrum of this competitive ring which means take the set of all its maximal ideals and on that maximal spectrum impose the so called Zariski topology there is a Zariski topology on this side there is something called a Zariski topology on any ring in on any commutative ring which you would have come across in a course in commutative algebra but anyway I will recall it and if you the fact is if you put that topology on this on the maximal spectrum amazingly you get back your affine space. So the beauty you see the beauty of the dictionary is that I am able to see the affine space on this side without ever going to that side. So you see this is the kind of uh, you know uh, translation that one is able to do and then there are there are there are many more uh, things that happen on this side that that can be seen here and vice versa okay so this discussion will will proceed in that direction okay so i'll continue in the next lecture